Before I start the show, I want to thank both Robin and Anne for their support. My desire is to keep this show ad-free and without interruptions, and your support is gratefully received. Thank you. And now, on with the show. In 2005, a skull was found. It's known as Skull 5, or D4500. Sounds a bit ominous, right? Like something out of a science fiction movie. Well, it's not. It's called Skull 5 because it's one of five. There are four others. They're estimated to be around 1.8 million years old. And Skull 5 is the best of the bunch. It's the most complete hominin skull ever found. It remained hidden in a cave for almost two million years. So where is this cave? It's in Dominici, Georgia. Georgia the country, not the state in the US. What makes the Dominici skull special, other than being remarkably well-preserved, is a couple of things. One, it's the skull of a Homo erectus adult. And also, it might change everything we previously thought about the fossils we've thus far found along the Hominin River. There is grandeur in this view of life. Welcome to Evolution Talk with Rick Coast, an introduction to the oldest story ever told. This fossilized human Homo erectus skull may be about to change the textbooks. Excavated in Georgia, it's believed to be 1.8 million years old. Four other skulls at the same site make up a group that appears to disprove theories of several separate Homo species emerging from Africa. To begin the story of the skull, we have to go back to 1991. That's when Georgian anthropologist David Lord Kipenitsi first stepped into a cave in Dominici and realized he'd stepped back in time. There, he found traces and evidence of an ancient, a very ancient, human occupation. This is David Lord Kipenitsi during a 2011 CNN interview. I could say that we have presence of earliest Homo erectus out of Africa, and maybe Eurasia was origin of the Homo erectus. Not Africa, as we thought. Not Africa. Previously, the assumption had always been that hominins had been restricted to Africa, evolving and developing there before journeying out into other regions of the world. It's why the focus has always been on Africa. It's a hotbed of fossils with more yet to be discovered. It's always been considered the mouth of the Hominin River. But this may not be the case. Whereas previous to the discovery of the Davinici skulls, popular theories placed the evolution of Homo erectus in Africa. Those theories may be turned upside down. The prevailing view was that humans left Africa only one million years ago. What we found in Dmanisi, it dates almost two million. Over the years, the Hominin River has given up many fossils with many different identifications. We've talked about a number of them over the last few episodes as we travel along the river's banks to get to our species Homo sapiens. Homo erectus has long been thought to be our ancestor, maybe the last one that branched off to evolve into modern humans. Others that we've looked at have been the Australopithecine and Homo habilis. There's another one that we haven't really talked about and that's Homo rudolfensis. I've left it out previously because we only have really one good specimen of its existence the top part of a skull. It was found in the Kubifora region around Lake Turkana in Kenya by Richard Leakey's team in 1972. Leakey felt it belonged to the Homo species, but at the time he was unwilling to give it a name. Might it be Homo habilis? Well, many fossils found were often tossed into the habilis category. This particular creature's brain case indicated a brain that was larger than that of Homo habilis. It wouldn't have a name until 1986, when it was called Homo rudolfensis. And this is the thing about all of this. When a skull is found, a considerable amount of study goes into classifying it. Brain case capacity is calculated, brow ridges are measured, 
the size of the teeth are taken into account, and also the curvature of its jaws. When it becomes difficult to match it to an existing specimen, a new name is given to it. It's described as something new, as was done with Homo rudolfensis, based on that one good specimen. It's happened many times over. In Dominici, the five skulls found by Lord Kipponizzi and his team are all dated to around the same time. They were found in the same place. Yet, there are minor differences. Differences that were the skulls to have been found in different places might have identified them as belonging to five different species. Maybe even new species. Now, given these differences, and perplexed that they all existed at the same place and roughly the same time, researchers in Georgia looked at the variations in our own skulls. They did the same with the skulls of chimpanzees. And what did they find? Well, put it this way. If, two million years from now, my skull were found here in what's now the region of New Hampshire, and another adult male skull, maybe even of a person related to me, were found in the area of what's now Oregon, those future anthropologists might classify us as being from two different species of hominin. Now, what if we've been making the same mistake all along? Well, let's put the Domini sea skulls aside for just a moment and talk for a few minutes about the species they've been identified as belonging to, Homo erectus. As we know, the Hominin River is winding and somewhat difficult to navigate. There are bends, there are tributaries, and there's a bunch of dead ends. There are even loops that make little sense and it's very easy to get lost. There's even waterfalls. When it comes to identifying and naming the different offshoots, it becomes increasingly difficult, especially when it comes to the part of the river that leads to us. Now, this quandary is best articulated by the famous naturalist Charles Darwin in his book, The Descent of Man. In a series of forms graduating insensibly from some ape-like creature to man as he now exists, it would be impossible to fix on any definite point where the term man ought to be used. That's very well put, Mr. Darwin. The erectus in Homo erectus means upright, so basically upright man. They who walked upright on two legs. They walked tall, maybe as much as five to six feet, taller than Homo habilis and others, and in a lot of ways, they resembled modern humans with brains a little more than half the size of ours, which isn't bad for an ancient ancestor. Fossil remains of Erectus have been dated to 1.8 million years ago, with the last of them dying out as far as we can tell around 100,000 years ago. Some even suggest they may have existed up until 35,000 years ago, but that's really a matter of debate. So considering the fact that we as a species appeared on the scene around 200,000 years ago, that means we coexisted with Erectus for quite a long time, as we did with the Neanderthals, Homo floresiensis, and others. As far as Homo erectus goes, they're known to have spread far and wide with most of their specimens found in Indonesia and also in China. As I mentioned, when a skull is found in different places with slightly different morphology, there's a tendency to want to designate a new species. Some suggestions have been to split Homo erectus into three. Homo ergaster for those found in Africa, Homo erectus for Asia, and Homo heidelbergensis for Europe. There was even talk about the Demonisi skulls from Georgia being named Homo georgicus. None of that's confusing, right? Anyway, the first Homo erectus fossil found was by Dutch surgeon Eugene Dubois in 1891 then called the Java Man because it was found on the island of Java, and it was later dated to being one million years old. Dubois found a molar, a thigh bone, and the top part of a skull. As far as famous erectus fossils go, well, we have a couple. There's the Java Man that I just mentioned, the Chakana Boy found by Leakey's team in 1984, and the Peking Man found in the 1920s and 30s. The Peking Man isn't actually just one, it's represented by a number of individuals found near Beijing. The Takana boy was around nine years old when he died, and that was 1.5 million years ago. His fossil has the distinction of being the most complete one ever found. So the Java Man and the Peking Man fossils were later to be renamed Homo erectus by Ernst Mayer in 1950. Another interesting fact about Homo erectus is their use of tools. 
these weren't the old Dewan tools found amongst the fossilized remains of Homo habilis and Paranthropus. These were a bit more advanced. These were Acheulean hand axes. Instead of a tool chipped away to be sharp on one side, Acheulean tools were bifacial, meaning they were crafted on both sides. Often pear-shaped in structure, they most likely had a number of uses. One thing they would have been especially good for is cleaning the meat off of bones. Let's go back to Dominici and the five skulls. Um, the population that we find at Dominici in Georgia, 1.8 million years, that these five individuals there belong to one single species that we call Homo erectus. That's Professor Christoph Zollikoffer from the University of Zurich in a BBC interview from 2013. If you remember from a few moments ago, the researchers in Georgia realized that had these skulls been found in different spots, they may have been classified as being from different hominin species. And because they were all of the same time and found at the same place, they are known to be the exact same species, Homo erectus. There's a lot of variation at Dimenisi, even though the specimens are coming from the same time, same place. So how do we begin to understand that? One way of understanding that is that at Dimenisi, unlike these early African sites that we have, we're sampling more variation associated with a normal population. That we have, for example, males and females from the same site, from the same time and place. That's Professor of Anthropology Adam Van Arsdale. What this may all mean is a shift in how hominin fossils are classified, especially those found at the time the population in Dimenisi lived. Might everything be a form of Homo erectus in its many varieties? Just like we humans today in all of our various sizes and differences. We propose a, a shift of paradigm, and in that sense we are a little bit like the kid in the famous fairy tale of the emperor's new clothes. So it's difficult to see that the emperor is actually naked. Now that's Professor Christoph Zollikoffer again, and he's right. But instead of watching a, a naked emperor walking by, we are standing on the banks of the Hominin River yet again, watching the canoes of our ancestors drift by. Given what we suspect now, those ancestors really look the same in many ways. Some are bigger than others, and some are smaller in stature. When they wave, we wave back. The waters ahead appear devoid of the many tributaries that we expected to see for a stretch, may actually be just one long river. Well, it's a change of perspective in the sense that we focus our interest now on population and evolutionary biology, and we go a little bit away from categorizing things into different species without actually having an idea how they were adapted to different ecological niches. And those ecological niches, well, they lead directly to you and I. Who knows where it will all end up? I hope you enjoyed today's episode of Evolution Talk. I'm Rick Coast, and if you find value in this show, consider supporting it at evolutiontalk.com. I'd love to keep the show alive and without ads, and I can only do so with your assistance. Help spread the word and share the show with your friends. At evolutiontalk.com, you'll also find more information, recommended books, and also ways to contact me. I'd love to hear from you. I hope your week is going well, and until next time, please take care of yourself. Evolution Talk is a Rick Coast production. Shazbat, nanu nanu.